This is Sagittarius A, the black hole in the center of the Milky Way, simulated in C++ using OpenGL. You've probably heard of black holes being crazy objects with gravity so strong that not even light can escape. But no matter how crazy you believe these objects are, you are wrong. And in this video, I hope to show you firsthand by using real physics equations to simulate the effects of black holes in space. So, let's start off with the plan. Simulating a black hole unsurprisingly has multiple parts to it. Firstly, black holes have the ability to curve light around them, creating these super cool effects that we'll be diving deep into later. To simulate this, I need to create a ray tracing engine. Similar to our own eyes, a ray tracing engine creates images using light rays. But instead of absorbing light like our eyes, it shoots out rays from the screen and calculates the path they take to their origin. For the black hole, we can use physics equations to alter the path of these rays based on the pull of the black hole. If this sounds confusing, no problem. Let's start with a 2D model. I begin by initializing OpenGL in an engine struct and running a window in the main loop. First, I'll create two structs for the black hole and the light rays. A struct is a simple way of creating your own data type that can store its own variables and functions. The black hole will have a position vector, a mass, and the event horizon. The event horizon is the distance at which not even light can escape a black hole. We can calculate it using the Schwarzschild radius formula, and in our simulation, it will act as the radius. Keep this formula in mind though, because it comes up again later. Now to draw the black hole, here's some deja vu. Because OpenGL doesn't have a default circle function, we have to create our own. So let's create a simple draw circle function in the black hole struct. By iterating over the radians of the circle, we can get the sine and cosine values for each angle and multiply them by the radius to get a perfect circle. Then using the position values, we can offset the center to get full control over the black hole's position. Pretty simple. Now moving on to the ray struct, for now we'll just add an x and y component. In a simple draw function, we'll draw a point using their x and y coordinates. Then we'll create a step function that takes the velocity of light, 299.72458 meters per second, in a given direction and moves the light forward in small increments. Now let's initialize the ray in the main loop and run the simulation. This is nice, but I kind of want to see the path of the light as it moves forward. Let's add a trail vector to track the ray's previous positions. Each update will push the new x and y coordinates to the trail, and then blend it so that the trail is brightest at the tip and fades out near the end. Now in the main loop, we can initialize a cluster of rays in a line and run the simulation. Isn't that neat? But obviously, if this was a real black hole, the light rays wouldn't be so chill going right through it. So now, let's actually implement the physics to alter the path of the rays. Firstly, we'll be using polar coordinates instead of normal x and y. Polar coordinates are centered to the black hole. r is the distance of the black hole to the ray, and pi is the angle from the x-axis. Here's a grid to help you visualize the two coordinates. Since our black hole is at 0, 0, r can be calculated using the simple distance equation. But for all the pro programmers out there, we can use the hypotenuse function that does the same thing. Then, pi can be calculated using using the a tan function that takes in the x and y and outputs the angle. Step 1 complete. Pretty easy. Now quickly using our new polar coordinates, let's add an if statement to stop the rays from flying right through the black hole. If r is less than the Schwarzschild radius, the point of no return, we can just skip stepping the ray. Let's test it out real quickly and... Perfect. So far so good. Now we have to take a bit of a step back because there's some pretty intense math and physics that need to be explained. Okay, so you've probably heard that the universe is made of this thing called space-time, and that big masses like stars or black holes can warp space-time, something we call gravity. This curvature does something very interesting to the geometry of space. Think of a plane flying around Earth. Planes always take the shortest path to their destination, but on a flat map, this path looks curved. This is the definition of a geodesic, the shortest path in a curved space. So that weird curved flight path is actually the straightest possible path if you take into account Earth's curvature. The same goes for space-time. All matter, including light, follows the geodesic path unless something is pushing on it. Right now, you're experiencing the ground pushing up on you, so you're not following the natural geodesic path towards Earth's center. This is intrinsically why you feel your own weight. Our goal now is to have our rays follow a geodesic, the shortest path through a curved space-time grid. This doesn't just mean apply gravity, it means calculate the shape of space-time itself. Because light is the fastest thing in our universe, it goes on a path that nothing else can go on because we experience the time dimension while light doesn't. So we need to find the special path called the null geodesic. The tool physics gives us for this is the Einstein field equation. It's a law that connects mass and energy with the geometry of space-time. But this doesn't give us a direct answer. To get actual paths, we need to solve it under specific conditions, which by the way is like the hardest thing to do in all of physics. That's why in 1915, Carl Schwarzschild looked at this equation and thought, what if we took everything out of the universe and just left a still, 
spherical mass. That would leave the entire right side of the equation to zero. Solving for this, he created the Schwarzschild network that is even able to predict the curvature around a non-spinning black hole. And it's what we'll be using in our simulation. That's a lot of physics talk. So hopefully you have a clear idea of what we're trying to do here. Find the shortest path on a curved grid. So let's create a geodesic function outside of our structs that takes in the ray and the event horizon. In our ray structs, we'll add the dr and d pi parameters. These will act as our velocities for our polar positions. Now we need to figure out how fast those change. Change. What is the acceleration of the direction of light? Key point, not speed, direction. The equation that will help us find the rate of change of the direction, well, we have to calculate it ourselves from the geodesic equation. This is the geodesic equation. It helps us find the straightest possible path in a curved spacetime. We could literally use this equation to find the shortest path for a plane around the globe. This xu variable refers to any of the coordinates, t, r, or pi, that we'll plug in one at a time to get our equation for. This value here is the affine parameter. It's an arbitrary step size that we use to move forward in our simulation. Bringing it together, this entire part of the equation just means the acceleration of one of the coordinates, r or pi. So let's start by filling in xu for our pi coordinate, the coordinate we're trying to find the acceleration for. Now here comes the tricky looking part, the Christoffel symbols. Written like an upside down L, these are what actually encode the curvature of space-time caused by the black hole. The rest of the right hand side of the equation are just the velocity of components we already have, dr and d pi. So to find the second derivative of pi, or how the angular velocity changes, we use this specific Christoffel symbol. Simplifying it down, we get 1 over r. Plugging this into the geodesic equation, we get the second derivative of pi is equal to 2 over r times dr times d pi. And it's the same line of steps for our r coordinate. We plug in the relevant Christoffel symbol and simplify. And we end up with the second derivative of r being negative c squared times the Schwarzschild radius divided by 2 r squared plus r times d pi squared. These are the two final equations that give us our acceleration values for r and pi. So now we can just enter these equations into the geodesic function. More than having a complete understanding on how these calculations work and all, it's important that you understand the higher level of what they mean. This one is just finding out how fast our ray moves closer to the black hole, and this one is finding out how fast the angle changes relative to the black hole. And just understanding that these equations are calculating the shortest possible path on a curved space-time grid, like the plane on the Earth, that's all we really need to know. Now, in our step function, we can use our geodesic function to define the acceleration values for r and pi. These second derivative values will update our first derivatives, dr and d pi, which will directly update our r and pi position values. Then we can translate these back into normal Cartesian coordinates and push them back in our trail. Now let's initialize the rays again and run the simulation. Isn't that neat? We can now clearly see the light being curved here by the black hole, and even some rays spiraling in. I was even able to initialize a ray that completed three complete orbits before flying off. But I'm noticing a few funny little errors here. This light ray took a giant step directly into the black hole, and the path of the light seems a bit too straight for my liking. After some research, I found out that the problem stems from our step function. We're using something called the Euler's method, taking our acceleration and applying it to our velocities and position directly. But this is like driving high speed on a curved road in pitch dark. We're making sharp steps forward since we don't have context on what's coming next. The solution is something called Runga Kuda 4 or RK4. What RK4 does is it doesn't just take one step forward, it takes four steps forward, all in one go. And then based on those four steps, it has a much more educated guess on what the accurate position of the light would be. So let's create an RK4 function underneath the geodesic function. Essentially, we'll be running the geodesic equation four times. And each time we'll be creating a new ray based on the new position. And at the end, we'll average out the four states using the special RK4 formula to get the most accurate path of the light. And that should be it. As you can see, we see much more realistic curves and no rigid steps compared to the old Euler's method. This is about as accurate as our 2D ray simulation can really get. Really quickly, I had the idea to add two black holes, meaning two entire polar coordinates, and here is what that looked like. Pretty neat. So with our 2D demonstration complete, and hopefully your understanding of black holes expanded, let's move on to the 3D version. Other than adding a Z coordinate or a theta value to all our objects, there's a small problem with moving to 3D. You see, to run an 800 by 600 pixel simulation, that's 480,000 rays per frame. And each of those rays go through four different evaluations and Runga CUDA in tiny small steps. In experimentation, I found that in order to render the black hole in frame, our lights would have to complete at least 10 to 20,000 steps 
steps forward. All of that becomes a very heavy load on my poor CPU, but we'll worry about performance later. Let's just get a working ray tracer going. I'll skip the boring parts, but essentially I set up a quad texture. A quad texture is like a picture that will display our screen based on a list of pixels that we give it. All we need now is a list of pixels, and our screen will be whatever pixel values are on that list. So if we have the first half of the pixels set to red, our screen will be half red. Isn't that neat? Now in the while loop, we can run an 800 by 600 array of rays, and if they do intercept the black hole, we can set their corresponding index values in the pixels list to red. But these rays need some initial values. So let's create a camera struct with an orbital navigation system just like in Blender, and shoot the rays out given an FOV. Then in a for loop of 20,000, we'll run the RK4 steps and update the rays. So with our 800 by 600 by 20,000 by 4 step procedure complete, it's time to test whether my CPU can actually handle all that. Well, that one is expected. Like I mentioned, there's no way my CPU could reasonably do that many calculations with a good frame rate. In fact, I set up a clock to calculate my frame rate and I got some pretty scary numbers. But I could see my simulation was definitely working. When I added a boolean value to disable curving the light, the simulation ran fine. However, the second I turned it on, it went ice cold. And that's where we had to switch from my CPU to my GPU. While CPUs are like Michelin star restaurants that can make multiple types of food with unique recipes, GPUs are like McDonald's. There's no fancy business at McDonald's. It's just fast, reliable burgers over and over. And it's perfect for doing the repetitive calculations for our light rays in parallel. To run my simulation using my GPU, I create a new script in GPU language called geodesic.com. This script will run super fast and then return back all the values of the rays to my main script that is powered by my CPU. We're going to transfer the ray struct, the geodesic and RK4 equations, and then run a 20,000 step loop in geodesic.com. If the ray intercepts a black hole, it's set to red and breaks. Otherwise, we run the RK4 function and update the position. And then once the loop is done, we'll return the final color. Okay, this is definitely better than what we had before, but I'm going to reduce my screen resolution from 800 by 600 down to 400 by 300, just to make it a little bit faster. This feels much better, and the simulation seems to be working well. But now is the moment we've all been waiting for. I want to see the halos around the black hole. I want to see how black holes warp objects around them. So let's add an objects list to our simulation. In geodex.com, we're going to create a simple disk around the black hole, along with an object checker to detect when the ray intersects with the objects. So let's see the final product. While I show you guys more of these images, I just want to mention my dearest thank you to all of you that watched, liked, subscribed, and commented on my last video. If you haven't already, may I just allow your mouse to follow its natural geodesic path towards that beautiful subscribe button. It would really mean a lot. To learn coding and create cool projects like this, I recommend signing up for codecrafters.io, linked in my description. It's free and a perfect place to learn low-level skills like this. I truly appreciate you all. I reply to basically every comment on my videos, so you can contact me via the comment section below, or you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram as well for DMs and updates on my project and from the deepest point of my heart i thank you very much for watching love you guys <sighs>